Hello, welcome to the episode in the Let People Prosper series. My name is Dr. Vance Ginn. Today, I've got another freedom fighter, a champion who is a liberty fighter as well for prosperity, just for breaking down government, getting government out of the way as much as possible. That's what he fights for each and every day. Um, if you want someone in the ring with you about prosperity and liberty and, and freedom, this is the person that you want. It's none other than Texas State Representative Matt Schaefer. Matt, welcome to Let People Prosper Show. Vance, uh, I couldn't have paid you to give a better introduction. I, I'm humbled by that and uh, very glad to be with you. <laughs> well, it's true, Matt. And, you know, we built a friendship over the years. And that's why I feel comfortable calling you Matt here. Uh, I hope that's okay. Please uh, do. But I but I really wanted to have a good conversation with you today about what's going on a little bit in Texas, but also your background and just some of the things that you're fighting for and what we should be fighting for. So before we get to all that, I first want to give the audience your background and your bio here um, to make some of the important points so they'll know what to, what to consider. So first of all, um, he is married to Jacelyn, who directs the Apache Bells of Tyler Junior College. They are parents to two young children, and Matt has broad and unique experience in the private sector and in public service. He retired as lieutenant commander in the U.S. Navy Reserve in 2021. Thank you for your service, Matt. I and, honored. Yes. In 2010, he served in Afghanistan near the Iranian border with a provincial rec reconstruction team. In the private sector, he is self-employed working in real estate and law. He was first elected to the, the Texas House of Representatives District 6 in November of 2012, uh, right around the Tyler area, it includes Tyler, after successfully challenging incumbent Rep. Um, Leo Berman in the Republican primary. Matt is a sixth-generation Texan. Yes, he and Jacelyn are proud to make their home in Tyler, where they met in Sunday school at Green Acres Baptist Church. Awesome. And were married in, 20, in 2001. Matt has degrees in finance and law from Texas Tech University. Guns up. Jacelyn is a graduate of TJC and holds undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Texas at Tyler. Growing up during hard financial times, Matt learned to work at an early age. His first job was at age 13 when he and his older brother, Sean, hoed weeds in pe peanut fields for minimum wage. Throughout high school, Matt worked uh, mowing lawns, fixing fences, hauling hay, and sacking groceries. He played football at Cisco Junior College before heading to Texas Tech. Matt paid his living expenses in college by running his own window washing business, working at an iron foundry, and as a bank clerk. Just all over the place, Matt. So again, welcome to the Let People Prosper show. Thank you. Uh, you know, my back uh, still hurts from some of that stuff over the years. I, I did a lot of manual labor growing up. Well, I, I can only imagine, <laughs> but it helped to give you those instincts that you have now of, of how hard work is yeah. really the important part of being of living the American dream. So speaking of living the American dream, what motivates you, Matt, to do what you do each and every day? Vance, I believe that we truly do have an exceptional form of government here in the United States and in Texas. I do believe that God institutes government and that he's made us stewards of that. And I see the liberty and the blessings that I've been able to enjoy. And I, I do look back on the, my upbringing uh, in rural West Texas, where you know we lived through, my parents came out of inflation in, in the 80s and, and 70s, and the oil patch went south, and we were all working whatever job we could find. And I, I spent my young adult life around working people, around people who wore their name on their shirt, you know, who tried to repair their own vehicles, it just patched things together. And when I got into state government, that's always been at the foremost of my mind is what are we doing to that guy who he runs his business with a spiral notebook in the front seat of his pickup truck. And these business associations, sometimes these big corporate interests come to Austin and they want to create new regulations, new occupational licensing things. And it's always for public safety and the consumer well, they all have HR departments and secretaries and uh, CPAs and lawyers to help them deal with these new regulations. Who does that guy that runs his business with a spiral notebook in the front seat of his pickup, who does he have? Um, how, does, is he going to, instead of you know catching a ball game with his son, is he going to go find a desk and, and a lamp? Uh, and, and try to put all his receipts together and hope the IRS doesn't come down on him, hope hope that he's doing it right and he doesn't get penalized and get a nasty letter from the IRS one day saying you owe all this money and or, or, or a letter from a state agency that shows up and says, you've been violating the law. You, you broke some building code, you know, didn't you know you're supposed to be doing this? And, you know, they're out of, they're out of a job, you know, they're hurt. 
so I, I've, I've been around those people all my life and I have a great affection for them. And I do think if you want to let people prosper, you have to have a minimum amount of regulation and a maximum amount of freedom. You know, the government should be an umpire, but not mm -hmm. a participant out there in the world that we work in. And heavy taxation, heavy regulation, it just kills people. That's exactly right. Well said, Matt. And I, and I think you hit a lot of key points that I want to talk about today. You know, when you're looking at your background from growing up, like you said, in West Texas, but also serving in the military, you know, what are some of the other things that you would want to add to your bio that maybe isn't listed or, or even diving yeah. in deeper in some of the things that is listed already, like, like serving in the military? Did that help you yes. to understand more about just how people live in other parts of the world or, or something else that you'd want to add for the audience? Well, I'll add two more points. One, okay. uh, you know, my older brother, Sean, who, who we worked in the peanut fields together. Yeah. You know, later, uh, you know, when he was in college uh, and I was just out of high school, you know, he was struggling for money uh, and he had gone to work for a roofing company. And the mm -hmm. guy that he was working for didn't treat him very fairly, but my brother's a skilled guy and he started to learn. He learned how to do it. So one day he just said, Matt, let's just start doing this on our own. Huh. And, you know, we, we roofed a bunch of houses and, and we got it done and we didn't make a lot of money, but we made decent money and we did a good job. You know, my brother knew how to do it. I was a strong back in a weak mind. I could haul those, you know, shingles up on the roof. And <laughs> um, when I got in the legislature, there was a huge effort, even recently, to start regulating and licensing roofers. I was that guy. They would have made my brother and I into criminals. We would be criminals. We'd be violating criminal statutes if we tried to do today what we did then, uh, if they had their way. Uh, and I have been successful, uh, me and some other members, in blocking that legislation. But it doesn't stop those big roofing companies from trying to come in and squash all the little guys. So roofing freedom. Uh, and then I think, you know, maybe in the military experience, uh, being in Afghanistan, out there near the Iranian border, which was just, just a really rough place. I saw what Liberty Lost looks like. Mm. I, I saw when a place where there was no rule of law. It was just who had the most guns and the most men. That's, that's who was in charge. Wow. And I saw what it's like to just have a place where women have no rights, where you know, there are no property rights. It was justice at the point of a gun. And I don't want that ever, ever to be the case in the United States or in Texas. And so it's truly exceptional what we have. And when you see an extreme example like that, it, it makes you realize we're really not, human nature is such that, you know, you can slip into a really bad place in just a generation, in just a, in just a decade. Energy poverty, food scarcity, uh, no rule of law. And, and you're back into medieval times quickly. No, that, that's right. Um, and so I, what, I'm, what I'm seeing here is what's helped create this man today who's really excited about liberty, you know, growing up kind of lower income, but having to work hard, you know, overall, uh, working hard while you're in the military, working hard where you got your law degree. I mean, it's, it's just one thing after another. And now in your professional life as well, what got you to the place you are today of being in the legislature and, and fighting hard um, along the way. You know, one of the things that I've admired about you is that you're you're willing to take on those big feats, those, those hard challenges that are there. And I think you're your history, your, your upbringing has got you to that point. You know, for example, you've been on um, House Appropriations Committee, one of the key committees in the legislature, in the House anyway. Um, and it's it, it's kind of difficult. You and I have had some conversations about, you know, it's difficult to get some things done there, but you're willing to keep up that fight. You know, what what keeps you going uh, within those fights that you have? And, 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 and what have you kind of experienced while you've been on some of these key committees? Well, you know, when I became sort of politically aware in the 90s, uh, Republicans stood for being fiscally conservative. They talked a lot about the federal debt. They mm -hmm. talked about uh, spending too much money. And the Republican Party has gotten away from that a lot. Uh, I think there's, you know, just been a lot of deficit spending over and over again. And maybe people have just become numb to it. Yeah. But I think that should remain a core Republican tenet, that we should not spend too much money. We should not grow government beyond the ability of our neighbors and our families to pay that government uh, expense. And so on the Appropriations Committee, I think I'm always trying to find ways to Let's actually talk about limited government, not only how much we spend, but where we spend it. Why should we spending it, be spending it there at all? 
uh, and to just try to get Republicans to come back to, to what we used to be on that, yeah. to, to be people who really care about limited government. And if you don't have economic freedom, you don't have freedom, right? And, and if the government is taking too much of your paycheck, then, then you don't have freedom, right? And so spending, what government spends, it has to take from people. And, you know, deficit spending is just delayed taxation. Uh, so we've got to pay attention to debt. We've got to pay attention to spending because it affects people's everyday lives. It affects their standard of living. It affects what wealth they can accumulate to pass on to their children. And it's what makes us a special place is that we do have economic prosperity. No, that's right. Well said. Um, and, and when you do look out there, you we, maybe we can start off with some of the federal things that are going on, and then we can highlight some of the good things that Texas has been doing. Um, and 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 you're right; it has been both parties. It's been Republicans, it's been Democrats, different yeah. presidents. Where you've seen the growth of government and government spending, massive deficits over time. You know, um, even while I was at the Trump administration, we had a budget that would have saved four point six trillion dollars over a decade. But you know, we still didn't balance the budget for like fifteen years. That, that's right. the sort of problems that you have. And nobody wants to face those bigger issues like Social Security, Medicare, some of the quote unquote entitlements, which I don't think we're entitled to anything except, you know, death, really. And and, and the grace of God, if, if we're able to get that uh, with that sort of freedom that you're able to have through uh, the, the Christian faith. But but along those lines, it's too often that we're becoming more and more dependent on government. It's just one spending program after another. Um, and then how do they tax? Well, we're getting a limited amount of taxation, and it's a bad form of taxation with an income tax that slows the economy, keeps more people in poverty in the process. And, and at the same time, you have these large safety net programs that incentivize people to not work. Because if you work, if you get more income, then you lose that amount of money in the process. And and I, and I wonder, I know you've thought about some of these things, but at, in D.C., just taking a step back a little bit more from Texas, is what do you think they should really be focusing on? Because I know a lot of the listeners are also focused on what Congress and then maybe the next you know Republican president could do in 2025. Texas should take our budget surplus that we have uh, yeah. that came from two reasons. One is it's inflation because sales tax is pegged to inflation. But two, the Texas economy has been performing pretty well compared to the other states. We should return as much of that tax surplus back to the taxpayer as possible. Yeah. Secondly, I think we have to stop chasing federal money. You know, I brought this up in a recent appropriations committee hearing about taking all this federal money and, and the state of Texas through the text dot through our transportation department is going to start building uh, electric vehicle charging stations. Why is state government in the business of building charging stations? They don't build gas stations or truck stops. Uh, that's not how our country works. Let the private sector handle that. Yet we're going to chase this federal money that's all just printed, borrowed money. It's just delayed taxation. Send that money back. Don't even take that money and let the private sector handle that. Another example was um, all this crazy money that's going into rural broadband. Well, Starlink is out there. I, right now, I'm talking to you with a Starlink connection. Okay. Nice. And, and, I, and I've got family way out in West Texas. Way, I mean, like they live so far out, they had to have the power company come out there and hook up a, a new power line, right? Huh. And uh, so they're using Starlink and yeah. it's becoming more, the capacity that's more and more. So why are we chasing billions of dollars for something where the private sector probably already has at least at least 50% of the answer. No, that, that's right. And of course, if Texas can show the way for what Congress and everyone else should be doing, I think that would be a good direction to go. One of the things that you know I've looked at over a number of years is as I've been working on the conservative Texas budget and trying to put together a spending limit, which there was a stronger spending limit passed last session. Um, we could always make it stronger, but I think it was, I think it actually is the strongest in the nation now because Colorado had their taxpayer bill of rights, but it's been weakened down by the Democrats over a number of years. So I think Texas does have the strongest, but of the last four sessions, which is basically since you've been in there, uh, maybe add one more that you've been in there, but the last four, the budget has been below population growth plus inflation. If you look at total appropriations compared with population growth plus inflation, which is a good measure of, you know, a reasonable measure for the average taxpayer's ability to pay for government spending. Um, I think maybe the base, we would might argue that the we're already spending too much, so why should it yeah. be growing at all? But you've got to start slowing it down before you can freeze it and then maybe even cut it over time. Let's 
let's get it headed in the right direction. But one of the things you mentioned earlier is we've got about around thirty billion dollars in surplus. There's going to be a lot of demands for that along the way, and I'm I'm with you. I think broadband, these other areas, should be left to the private sector. And if Congress keeps spending this money, well, just reject it um, because ultimately that falls on taxpayers. Whether it's coming out of your right pocket or left pocket, it's coming out of people's pockets along the way. Yeah, that guy, we've really got to do guy that. That, uh, that guy that runs a business with a spiral notebook he's only got one checkbook and so That's he doesn't right. he doesn't get into all these fancy arguments about whether this is federal funds or no. or state dollars or local dollars or county dollars he's got one checkbook Yep. And it always written out of the same bank account. That's a great point. And and I think too, you know, what what people were people really fired up about in Texas is the property taxes. We get our appraisals earlier this year. Uh, I got mine here in Round Rock, Texas. Mine was up 27% year over year. A lot of them are going up across the, across the state. And people are like, you know, my property tax bill is going to go up that much. Fortunately, you know, the legislature has made some reforms in 2019 to help to slow the growth. Um, so the actual rates won't go up that much, how much my increase is. But we've got a big problem, you know, Matt, with property taxes across the state. And I know that there's this movement to use some of the surplus dollars to buy down school M&O property taxes. Um, but what are some of the other ways that really, really, you know, that the state can really look at lowering the cost of living? Because I think we have an affordability crisis in Texas. Just looking all around us, it's difficult to rent. It's difficult to have a yep. mortgage. What are some of the other issues we should be looking at? Well, look at the regulations that go yeah. into uh, urban development, for example. Uh, they make it so that there's very little competition for urban development because only the big companies can really handle building uh, these types of projects. Mid and small size companies, man, it takes an army of people to overcome the permits that you have. So you have a problem with local regulations that have increased the cost to build. And I'll give you an example, a practical one. Uh, here in Tyler, you know, I talked to a builder who uh, really, he was specializing in building entry-level homes. And the city came in with a new ordinance that said, you have to spray foam the whole house and then come in with this device that puts a vacuum on it to measure how much the house is sealed. Well, that uh, spray foam um, over and above a, uh, a batting insulation, that's tr traditional insulation was about seven to eight thousand dollars more expensive. And, and, and what's the return on that? How long does it take to have an electricity bill that's ten dollars less or five dollars less month after month to get that seven or eight thousand dollars back? And you know, as an economist, if you add seven or eight thousand dollars to the price of a brand new starter home, you are pricing a significant number of people out, especially with the cost of mortgage rates now. So mm -hmm. look at your occupational licensing. Uh, the cost of labor to build things, look at your local ordinances and the regulations that are coming in, um, all in the name of climate and green, everything is making everything more expensive. It really is. And I mean, that, that's a great point. And I think it's something that needs to be looked at quite a bit because there are all these regulations that are in place and regulations act end up acting like a tax. <laughs> it reduces how much we could do with whatever it is that we want to do things with. Um, and and it, it acts as an opportunity cost. What are we giving up in the process? And I think too often within politics is we forget about we look a lot at the direct cost, but we don't look at the opportunity cost. I know it's something that you look at quite a bit, um, but why do you think that is? Why, why is it as a, as a politician that you're, that you're oftentimes, uh, you don't look at those opportunity costs? Um, is it more about just winning the next election cycle? Um, or is it about specific interest groups? Or is it maybe a combination of those things? I think it goes back to our education system. You know, mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, I was blessed in the community I grew up in and got a fairly decent education in a public, rural public school, but I had never heard the terms present value mm. or opportunity cost or comparative advantage. I had never heard those terms until I was probably a junior in college. Uh, and why is that? And so I think there are many people who, who don't even understand these things. Uh, they're, they're, not, they're not presented to them in, in an academic setting as they should be, yet these have huge impacts on the way we manage our personal finances, and we look at government. Yeah, that, that's right. What are some of the things that you hope to get accomplished this next session? we got a session coming up in, in January here in Texas. What do you hope that gets accomplished to let people prosper? Real property tax relief. Uh, I, I'm trying to uh, cut uh, regulations in occupational licensing. I'm right now I'm working on a bill 
uh, that would allow us to teach electrical trades in high schools where they actually get a license because there's these programs that do electrical, but they don't get a license so the kid can't go to work. Uh, I was successful last session in passing that for plumbing. We weren't teaching plumbing in the, in the state of Texas in high schools because if they taught it, the student got nothing for the training. And so I made it so that a a student can enter high school and leave high school with a, a tradesman plumbing license, actually get out there and work right away. Uh, I think this vocational training, this goes to all this stuff that we're talking about. You're giving people skills and opportunity to make money, but it also helps to overall cut out some of the artificial cost that's built into labor. When you when government creates an artificial shortage, because you say, if you don't have our permission slip to be a plumber, you don't have our permission slip to be an electrician, that permission slip better make a lot of sense. And many times it doesn't. And it creates artificially artificial uh, scarcity in the labor market. Uh, and so go talk to home builders. They can't get wiremen to come build the new homes that they just built. And so that delays and adds cost. And so if my electrician bill passes, there'll be all these residential wiremen coming out of high school that will flood the labor market and, and bring costs back down to a, a more uh, proper equilibrium, equilibrium, I think. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. And, and I'm hopeful too, you know, um, that there will be a way to get universal school choice this session. I, I, I really think that's important. Um, as someone who went to a private school, a small private school from kindergarten to second grade, public school from third grade to sixth grade, and then homeschool from seventh grade through 12th grade, whatever that schooling is should meet the needs of those individuals. That that met my needs um, for my family, but not everybody has that opportunity. You know, yes. um, my kids are going to a private school because my wife and I can afford it. But a lot of people don't have that opportunity to do that either, even though they're paying property tax taxes, maybe through the form of, of, of rent, renters still pay property tax or out of their mortgage. And you know, a lot of the money that's paid for schools across Texas anyway, is also paid through the general fund, you know, through franchise taxes and sales taxes and other things, whatever you're looking at it, who's someone who's been in, in, in a rural area um, and looked at from different areas. And you hear a lot, a lot of this. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on school choice? I want parental choice. And yeah, I'm trying to actually go. use that term more often. It's parental yeah. choice is what it boils down to. Right. The devil's in the details. I, I don't want a school choice or parental choice program. It's only for urban kids. I want it to benefit every family. I want to be able to add value to the educational experience of every student in the state of Texas. And if you're in that rural area, we should provide you with something that allows you to enrich your educational experience, whether that would be an extra robotics program, some tutoring, a, a, a math camp in the summer, horseback riding lessons, music lessons, something that helps that rural student, even if there's not a private school option for them, that's what I'm uh, about. But you're absolutely right, Vance. And I think parents are waking up to that more uh, and realize that there is a way for state government to use all this tax money that we collect to give parents more choice. I think that's right. And, and when you look at it, I think we've this this session is is shaping up to be an important session like they all are. But there are so there's headwinds that are coming our way. Uh, whether it be from what D.C. is spending, like we talked about earlier, all this excessive spending by Congress um, and then the Federal Reserve, of course, printing too much money, too much money, chasing too few goods. We have this massive inflationary problem that's going on. Uh, we've got energy issues that are going on. And, 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 you know, I've been saying this for a while, but I think we're in a national recession. We've had two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, declining economic growth. Um, we've had a third quarter that would have been declining. It would have been negative if you exclude net exports. So that would have been three quarters in a row of real GDP growth decline. Yeah. And I think this is the early stages of it. We haven't really seen, you know, the labor market's always a lagging indicator. Contrary to, to what the left wants you to believe, employers don't want to just go out and start firing people. They usually will lower their, you know, their hours or something along those lines first before they start firing people. So the household survey has already shown three months in a row that there have been net uh, firings across the nation. Although the establishment survey says about 200 plus, plus thousand jobs added per month. And so I think it's it's coming up and this will affect Texas, but Texas will be able to mitigate it a lot because of its pro-growth policies. It's more free market approach, which allows for people to be freer in the process. So it's just something for us to consider here in the session, but if anything, it should make us even more adamant about limiting spending, cutting taxes, cutting regulations, and everything else that you talked about. The last couple of minutes we have, Matt, 
what would you really like to tell the audience to tell others that are out there um, um, your last words here? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> Government belongs to those who show up. So find a way to engage. Uh, you know, I know people are busy. They're out there working to make a living. They're lucky to catch a ball game with their family on the weekend. You know, they can only keep up with a little bit of national politics. But what happens down in Austin matters a lot to people uh, in Texas. There's a lot of decisions that are made that affect your everyday life. So uh, try to find out who your state representative is. Find out who your state senator is. Uh, and get to know them, send them a message, talk to their staff. That's possible. And go get involved in a local uh, club. You know, there's Republican clubs, conservative clubs out there. Uh, find one and go meet people uh, and see what you can do to let your voice be heard. Because we all have a duty to, to try to hold this uh, Republican form of government together. Hey Amen. Well, I appreciate you, Matt, and everything that you're doing. Um, I'm going to keep praying for you and your family. God bless you. Um, and I look forward to the great things that you're going to do this next session. Uh, it's going to be a good one. Um, and so thank you to all the audience for being with us here on the Life Fuel Prosper Show. Please go and rank us as a five star, if you will. That'd be great. Um, and it's been great to have Representative, Texas State Representative Matt Schaefer on the Life Fuel Prosper Show. Thank you and let fuel prosper.